Okay, this lecture is for the topics in biochemistry uh, second year students and in this lecture we're going to cover uh, the use of various methods for analysing small animals and performing in vivo imaging, that is imaging within live animals. And this is the sort of um, work that I'll be talking about which is expressing proteins such as green fluorescent protein uh, and we'll also be covering luciferase as well. Uh, to be able to, in this case, visualise a growing tumour in the leg of a live mouse. And these are just some uh, green fluorescent protein expressing mice with their wild type litter mates. So this is an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the origins of green fluorescent protein, GFP, and also luciferase, and explain how both GFP and luciferase can be inserted into human cells. And when we look at this, we'll also look at how the in particular, the green fluorescent protein has been modified by genetic modification to make it a useful tool for studying human cells. We'll also look at both GFP models and luciferase models to see how they are useful in studying uh, disease in animal models and look at the relative benefits of each model. Okay, so we're going to be dealing with um, non-human proteins here that are uh, inserted into human cells and the source of these two main proteins that we're going to talk about we're going to look at the uh, luciferase family of proteins and one of the sources is firefly there are other uh, uh, animal species that produce uh, firefly that's uh, like firefly luciferase and then we're also going to be looking at the green fluorescent protein uh, proteins which come from a particular species of jellyfish Okay, so firstly, what we need to do is understand the difference between fluorescence and luminescence, because fluorescence is what comes from green fluorescent protein, hence the name, whereas luminescence is what comes from luciferase. And these two are very different, so we're going to look at the scientific basis of both of these phenomena. So you may have come across chemiluminescence. Uh, chemiluminescence is just a chemical reaction which gives off electro uh, magnetic radiation leading to emission of light and many reactions will do this you might have come across some of these in the lab um, but what we are going to be dealing with when studying um, luciferase and uh, luminescence is effectively an enzyme driven um, chemiluminescent reaction uh, which we would call bioluminescence. So this is where a living organism produces an enzyme, the enzyme cleaves a substrate, and when cleaved, that gives off some light. So this figure illustrates the difference between fluorescence and luminescence, and you should be well aware of these energy type diagrams where we have uh, an electron in a ground state which becomes excited somehow. So in fluorescence, that electron will become excited by uh, a photon of light hitting the molecule. That electron becomes transiently excited. It will drop down to a lower energy level and then maybe drop down again. And at this, at this state of dropping back down here, it is emitting a photon of energy. So it's losing some energy here by vibration and other effects. But here it is dropping down and emitting a photon of light as a package of energy. In a similar way, chemiluminescence works where there is some excitation effect due to a chemical reaction, and again, an electron dropping down to a intermediate energy state and then dropping down to the lower energy state and emitting a photon. So in both of these situations, you've got something exciting electrons, those electrons dropping down partially to a lower energy state and then dropping uh, down back to where it started from and at some point in that process uh, the electrons can emit a photon or a package of energy which can be emitted as a light photon. Now the important difference between these two are that fluorescence tends to be in general much brighter however you must put light into a system to get light out of a system. Now that, this means that you're going to get a bright signal but more background. And if you think to your um, analytical chemistry, you should be thinking about signal to noise ratios here. With chemiluminescence, there is no light input, 
so there is no noise within the system, but you get a very weak signal. So even though you get a very weak signal, you get a better signal to noise ratio with chemiluminescence or bioluminescence than you would with a fluorescence based si uh, system. Now the important thing you need to think about with these systems is what is the energy level of the light that enters the system, what is the energy level that comes out. And to excite a photon from here to here takes this much energy, because this is a measure of, you know, measure of energy, the light that comes out is of lower energy. So what you will always find is that when you put in light, you're going to put in high energy light and you're going to detect low energy light. So you could be putting in blue light, 400 nanometers. You could be getting out green light, 530 nanometers. That longer wavelength is lower energy light. And the shift from the excitation energy to the emission energy is what we call the Stokes shift. You'll come across this in other modules. So bioluminescence is a type of chemiluminescence, as I mentioned, it's driven by enzyme catalyzed reactions and the enzymes that we're dealing with in biological systems are the luciferase enzymes. And we can get these from various different sources, the firefly, which I've already seen, uh, vanilla luciferase, which comes from the sea pansy, and the jellyfish, the, uh, the jellyfish, which is the source of green fluorescent protein, also has a, a bioluminescent system going on. So the jellyfish can create uh, luminescence, which can then be picked up by its fluorescent proteins, which can emit light of different colours. We're really interested in the green ones. So this is the firefly, firefly luciferase catalyzed reactions. Um, and this basically just shows the chemical structure of luciferin. Luciferin is a substrate for luciferase. That creates this intermediate. And then that intermediate with, um, can break down to this final end product and result in the emission of light. So I want you to look at that reaction for a couple of minutes. Pause the video in a moment and I want you to figure out what things could be put into this reaction that would alter the rate of reaction to result in differential levels of light given out. So what is going to limit this rate of this reaction? So just pause the video now, have a couple of minutes to have a think about that and then restart. So hopefully if you understand uh, enzymatic reactions you will know that you could alter the amount of luciferin. Putting more luciferin you're going to get out more light. Equally if ATP was a limiting factor then you know, it doesn't matter how much luciferin you put in there if there's no ATP, pre ATP present you're not going to get any light. And then finally you can limit this system by limiting oxygen. Now all of those three things can be used um, in biochemical reactions to try to limit, uh, to try to test um, or perform biological experiments. So for example, I would use this luciferase reaction in uh, non-animal studies, just in cellular studies. And what I can do is if I've got some cultured viable cells that I want to I want to quantify how many cells are there. Those cells are all producing ATP. So what I could do is lyse open all of those cells, release the ATP, mix that supernatant with some luciferin in the presence of oxygen and measure the amount of light produced. And that will tell me how much ATP was in that suspension of lysed cells. And that will tell me a rough idea of the relative proportion of cells present in that cell suspension. Equally, I could use that experiment to measure the amount of oxygen in hypoxic studies. So some of the work that I do looks at um, three-dimensional cell cultures, uh, which you may come across later on in the course, where we grow cells in sort of balls of cells. And the center of those uh, balls of cells are hypoxic. They have no or very little oxygen. So we can exploit these sorts of luciferase catalyzed reactions to interrogate what's going on in those environments. And then finally, we can have situations where we have cells expressing uh, luciferase and we can use this reaction just to ask the question, how many cells are present? 
and this is why we're going to this is why we're talking about in vivo uh, imaging imaging in live animals because to cut a long story short we can put luciferin into uh, some tumor cells we can implant those tumor cells into experimental animals and then we can measure the amount of light coming out of those animals to see where the tumors reside and this slide also shows how else we can exploit this uh, luciferase based system in the biochemical assay situation and in this situation we've taken the luciferin core molecule and tagged onto it a short peptide sequence and that peptide sequence is cleaved by this enzyme caspase 3. It's an enzyme that is involved in programmed cell death and apoptosis. So caspase 3 or caspase 7 will cleave off this DEVD peptide, releasing free luciferin, which can then be catalyzed by luciferase and result in the production of light. Now in my routine experiments, I use both the luciferin-based system and the fluorescence-based system. Uh, a fluorescence-based system uh, uses a, a fluorogenic uh, caspase 3 substrate to produce light. So I have to shine light into a system to detect the presence of a fluorogenic substrate. So this line here shows the um, number of cells that are expressing caspase 3 in both a luciferase-based system and a fluorescence based system and this highlights the difference in signal to noise ratio here I've just put a line where the uh, signal to noise ratio of 3 is which is a nice standard cutoff and what you can see is when you have got a very, even a very small number of cells you know 30 50 cells we can detect a luciferase based system above our signal to noise ratio in a beautiful um, light, a straight line Whereas in a fluorescence-based system, we need many, many more cells before we hit our signal-to-noise ratio of 3. So a fluorescence-based system works for a 1,000 cells upwards, whereas a, a luciferase-based system works from about 30 cells upwards. And that's all because for a fluorescence-based system, you've got to put in lots of light. That gives a higher signal-to-noise ratio. For a luciferase-based system, you don't have any light. You're effectively doing the analysis in a dark box and you have a much better signal to noise ratio so a better overall sensitivity this is a really important uh, concept because this is going this concept is going to be applied to an experimental animal model very shortly and for biochemical assays this is how we detect that um, light that is emitted it's effectively a dark box plate reader it's a luminometer it takes 96 volt plates we add our substrate luciferin close the box so it's a darkened box and we have very sensitive light detectors in there that will detect light emitted from all 96 wells that's how we detect a luciferase based system whereas if it's a fluorescence based system it's a different box it's got a light source in there shining maybe blue light on the sample and then you're measuring green light being emitted and you get autofluorescence and that contributes to a poor signal to noise ratio so this slide illustrates the problem of um, fluorescence where I've already mentioned we have to excite this photon with a maybe a blue uh, with a blue light source that excites the photon we get a bit of molecular vibration and loss of energy and then we get emission of a green photon at 500 nanometers and what we see is the light source may well overlap with the uh, emission spectra um, we normally have a cutoff here uh, that can reduce sensitivity somewhat but it can also have some bleak potential bleed through of this light source into the emission spectrum and we can also get autofluorescence of the sample so you shine this light onto the sample and the sample just automatically gives out green light even in the absence of any proper true fluorescence and that contributes to a poor signal to noise ratio and as i mentioned earlier the difference between here and here is a stokes shift and a a very large stoke shift is quite beneficial for lots of situations to prevent interaction of the excitation source and the emission source. Okay, so we're going to look at the chemical structure of some fluorescent molecules and see how these compare to green fluorescent protein. So this is just ethidium bromide. It's um, a dye that you use in gel electrophoresis to stay in DNA, excite it with UV, and it emits in the red um, region. This is DAPI, 
uh, excite with uh, UV, it emits in the blue region. Uh, we use the sustaining DNA in um, nuclei of cells. So the common feature of um, fluorescent molecules is this alternate conjugated double bond uh, system. So all the way through this molecule there are alternate uh, double and single bonds. And to put simply, um, this allows simple reorganization of those bonds to effectively all shuffle along by one. That might be a very simplistic way of doing it, of explaining it, but if you imagine a photon of light coming in, exciting one or more of these electrons so that this jumps to here, this jumps to here, this one jumps to here, and then subsequently everything moves on by one. And then as those electrons revert back to where they were originally their most stable uh, position, that is where you get emission of that photon of light. So you put in a high energy photon to, shuff to shuffle them all along and you emit a lower photon of energy as they all revert back. So that is what we call a conjugated bond system and this is characteristic of fluorescent molecules. The question is how does this happen in a protein which have got peptide bonds which would effectively prevent a conjugated system from occurring. A green fluorescent protein uh, is a long uh, protein but within the protein is the fluorophore active site made up of these three amino acids and there's nothing in there that really tells you that you're going to get a conjugated system when you create peptide bonds here and here. However what happens with green fluorescent protein is upon activation particularly under an uh, oxidation uh, situation, you can get this reaction occurring here. So this carbon and this nitrogen linking together to create this five-membered ring. And what you will see is with the help of this group here creates a reasonable size conjugated system. Uh, so this system can absorb blue light and emit green light. The only problem with green fluorescent protein is it is technically speaking, quite a rubbish uh, fluorescent protein. Now this image shows um, some cells which have been transfected with a plasmid containing the sequence for green fluorescent protein, that's from the jellyfish, and put into human cells. Now when I say it's quite a, a rubbish green fluorescent protein, part of that problem is down to codon usage and I'll come on to codon usage in a moment. So this is the empty vector. You can't see anything because they're under a fluorescence microscope there are some cells there but they are not fluorescent green because they don't have the sequence for green fluorescent protein. Here we've taken a native GFP from a jellyfish and you can see there's a very weak green signal in those cells. Very very weak. Practically it is useless. So what has been done to this sequence is optimize it for mammalian codon optimization. Remember many amino acids can be coded by um, lots of different triplet codons. Jellyfish prefer some, we prefer others. We can all follow the same language, it's just that we might produce far more GGG for glycine uh, than a jellyfish does. So if we optimize the codon usage we get a mRNA which is much more efficiently translated in eukaryotic cells and we get a good green signal. This is useful. What we can then further do is mutate the green fluorescent protein sequence to make it brighter and tweak the active site, make a serine to threonine change and that makes it super bright and we call that enhanced GFP. So this is the original study that took the original native green fluorescent protein and tweaked all of those codons to make them optimized for eukaryotic, uh, I said eukaryotic cells, I mean human cells. Um, and this would make this a humanized GFP. So all of these codons that have got um, a DNA base change from the original native sequence, so this line here is the native sequence and here we have a codon for serine and that T has been changed to a C because C, the a, AGC is a more efficient codon in human cells than AGT, for example.
and that has been done all the way through the sequence to make the GFP more efficiently translated in human cells, whereas the native sequence is very efficiently translated in jellyfish. So that is part of what was done. And then to make the uh, enhanced, brighter GFP, we can start messing around with the uh, amino acid residues in the active flu uh, the fluorescence active site here. So you can see there's a serine to threonine change there, uh, tyrosine to histidine change there as well. So there are lots of different changes that you can do, and that will subtly alter the uh, properties of the green fluorescent protein. And when I say subtly alter the, pro uh, the properties of the green fluorescent protein, maybe it's not subtle, maybe it's actually quite major. And here what we can see are various changes, so that's uh, amino acid 66 uh, tyrosine to histidine, we've got this change here as well, so we can go for blue fluorescent protein, cyan, bright, enhanced GFP, um, a much more green GFP by looking at altering a different site. And we're now at the point where we can have every single colour of green fluorescent protein that you could possibly wish for. This is an agar plate with uh, bacteria expressing lots of different forms of green fluorescent protein from blue to green to yellow to red, um, sort of purpley colours. And these have all been generated by genetically modifying the native sequence, uh, tweaking it, and then we end up with different colours. And those different coloured green fluorescent proteins have lots of biological applications. And this is a more recent version of that information showing enhanced blue, enhanced cyan, enhanced green. We're into yellows, then we're into um, orange, M banana, which is um, a yellow, M tangerine, M cherry, and M plum right at the very far red. And these are really useful. We'll show why these are really useful later on, because these are, being in the red spectrum and infrared spectrum, uh, you can get much better tissue uh, penetration of light from these. And if we're dealing with in vivo imaging in animals, this is going to be really beneficial. So what we need to be able to do, now we've learned about green fluorescent protein and luciferase, is be able to use these in in vivo experiments. And the experiments I'm going to be showing you is how we can track tumours within mice. So tumour cells implanted into mice that have been labelled are expressing green fluorescent protein or this luciferase. So the simple uh, set of procedures that you need to do to do this is insert the gene for either luciferase or GFP into a plasmid vector, then express the luciferase or GFP in some cultured cells. We're going to use some cancer cells. Take those cancer cells, inject them into a suitable animal model, such as an immunodeficient mice. So we could be growing human cells in a mouse, using an immunodeficient mouse because the immune system will not recognize that those cells are foreign. And then we image the animal using one of two different imaging modalities, which I will show you. So the first step of inserting the gene for GFP or luciferase into a plasmid ve vector is very easy because we can just buy it off the shelf. This is my particular favored one. This is called Pmax GFP. And it's got all the standard features of a plasmid. It's got an origin of replication. It's got a canamycin resistance gene, so this means we can select the bacteria that have taken up this plasmid um, and pick that, green, pick that colony. Uh, we, can, we are also driving green fluorescent protein from uh, PCMV, it's a promoter of the cytomegalovirus. That's just a high expressing promoter. So that promoter is going to express green fluorescent protein when we get this plasmid vector into eukaryotic cells. So we initially clone in bacteria. So basically get this vector into some bacteria, grow them on canamycin. Only the cells containing this vector will survive. And then we can extract the plasmid from those bacteria. We then purify that vector and put this vector into eukaryotic cells. We can also use the same canamycin resistance gene to select for cells that have taken up this vector. Those cells should also be green. And this is just another vector for luciferase. So it is a slightly more complicated vector. Uh, it, express, uh, it, it has a um, ampicillin resistance gene for selecting when this vector has been successfully uh, put into bacteria. Uh, we've got a neomycin resistance gene for selection on 
uh, eukaryotic cells. We can use neonicin or G4N8, um, an antibiotic that would naturally kill, get into and kill uh, eukaryotic cells. So this is the resistance selection marker here. And then we have a CMV promoter again, expressing the luciferase gene here. And all other bits, such as polyadenylation signals and so on, that are useful for gene expression. So those are the two of my favourite vectors that I use for this sort of work. So, first thing, once you've got your vector that you've bought off the shelf, uh, you then um, transfect that DNA into uh, eukaryotic cells. I used, in this particular study, PC3s, which are prostate cancer cells. I got the DNA into the cells using an AMAX system. Uh, an AMAX, AMAX system is an uh, electroporator, so you have your suspension of cells, you pass an electric current through them with the plasmid DNA in solution. You also have that plasmid DNA bound up to some proteins bound to a nuclear localizing protein and the DNA gets into the cells and then gets into the nucleus and then spontaneously integrates within the host, this host cell genome and we start to get green fluorescent protein positive cells. And this is a colony of green fluorescent protein positive cells which I picked having gone through this whole process. And we selected this particular clone by adding the relevant uh, antibiotic, either hybromycin, neomycin, or one of the other eukaryotic um, antibiotics, or maybe blastocidin. Different vectors have different antibiotic resistance cassettes on them, and then use the appropriate antibiotic in your cell culture medium. So I picked my PC3 GFP colony, which is this one, expanded it, and then used it for subsequent experiments. Those subsequent experiments are injecting them into a suitable animal model, and in this case, we're dealing with either skid mice, severe combined immunodeficiency, or nude mice, which are athymic. They have got no thymus, they've got no T cells, but they also have no hair. Um, and both of these animal models will allow human cells to grow without eliciting an immune response to reject the tumours. So we can inject the tumours into these mice, either subcutaneously, into the mammary fat pad if we're dealing with breast, uh, tail vein if we want to look at where the tumours go around the circulation and where they eventually lodge, intracardiac uh, if we want to look for again systemic metastasis so that's we can inj this sounds tricky and it is tricky but imagine trying to inject 10 microliters of tumour cells into the beating heart of an anaesthetized mouse where that mouse's heart is doing 170 beats a minute and the heart is about half a centimetre across and hitting the left ventricle. It's quite a tricky, stressful procedure, but it works beautifully. And if you can get tumour cells into the left ventricle, those tumour cells whiz around circulation and then lodge in the bone marrow, the lungs, and then you can start to study uh, tumour growth as metastases. You can also inject them in any other particular site, and I'll show you some intratibial bone marrow injections. So once we've got our green fluorescent protein cells in our animals growing as tumours, we need to image them. And this is a fairly simple setup. Um, and this is my old setup, which is a glorified grey metal box. And that grey metal box contains two LED light sources, which emit very intense blue light. These come from by fibre optic cables from a light source that's somewhere down here. And on top of this box is a very sensitive CCD camera linked to some image analysis software. So basically what you can do is open this handle here, hold the mouse, put it under the camera, under this intense blue light, the tumours will glow bright green and you'll be able to take a picture of them with that camera. And this is what the pictures look like. So these are PC3 green fluorescent protein expressing uh, tumours implanted either subcutaneously into the prostate, so that's after an incision and ins insertion of cells into the prostate, and these cells are behind a layer of abdominal muscle, and we can still see them. And this is the intratibial model, where the tumours have, where the, you open up the front of the skin on the mouse, as on the mouse's tibia, drill two holes in the bone with a very, very fine needle. Uh, inject tumour cells through one hole until you see them start to squirt out of the other hole and then you know you've got some tumours within the bone marrow cavity. Just be aware 
a mouse's tibia is uh, the internal bone marrow cavity is less than one millimeter in diameter so we're dealing with very micro surgery here so we get the tumor cells into the mouse uh, and then we can shine the blue light on the mouse and we can see a bright green signal and that tells us there is tumor in that mouse now obviously we could tell that that tumor had got uh, that tumor was present on that mouse because it was over a centimeter across we could feel it but this mouse, we had no idea whether that tumour had taken or not until we imaged it with the GFP imaging system. So we couldn't feel a tumour, the mouse was showing no signs of any um, disease. It's only when we put it under the blue light that we could see it. And this mouse, this looks like a huge tumour. The tumour was implanted into the tibia here. We could not tell that this mouse had got a tumour. It wasn't limping, it wasn't showing any signs of distress. We couldn't even really see that there was a lump there. This is an overexposed picture. So this here was just a vast amount of light coming out of the tumour. And we couldn't see that this mouse had a tumour. And this is why we actually did this model. It's because the old ways of doing these animal models were to wait until the animal showed signs of distress. And that is when you know that the mouse has got a tumour. That's not a particularly ethical way of doing those experiments. We developed this model in particular because we thought that that old model was unethical. So uh, we developed this model so that we could visualize tumors much earlier, treat the mice with our experimental chemotherapies and watch the tumors regress rather than wait until mice had got these great big tumors on the legs and they were causing the mice severe distress. So that was the whole reason for doing this type of work and that's why this sort of work, partly it's a, it's a better it's a better model, uh, you get better data from it, uh, but also for animal welfare reasons, that's a, that was actually the main reason for doing this project. So the previous image was a great big tumour within the mouse's leg, and that tumour had probably already grown out of the bone marrow cavity. These are really what we designed the model for, to be able to see tumours in mice before we would ever know that uh, the mice had got tumours. So what we've got here, that is a mouse's leg, that is the thumb and the finger of the person holding the mouse. And what you can see, uh, firstly you can see that the skin is sort of autofluorescing a bit yellow. That's signal to noise ratio as I talked about earlier. Secondly you can see that there's a distinct green spot there and there is a green spot there and that is the tumour uh, growing in the mouse's bone marrow cavity. So in this study we wanted to find the first, you know, the smallest possible tumours that we could possibly find and redefine the limits of what GFP imaging could do in experimental animal systems. Uh, so this mouse here was sacrificed on the first day that we could see a green tumour, which was this particular day, and then when the mouse's leg was processed by histology, so that's taking off all of the muscle, um, fixing the tissues in formalin and then taking thin sections of that bone marrow uh, you would, this is what we could see now this in pink is the bone itself this is the injection site which where the bone is starting to close up and this here is the tumor right all around here is normal bone marrow this is the tumor it's about a millimeter across so that was redefining the limits of what GFP imaging could do in an experimental animal model. Prior to this, most people were detecting tumours at about 5 millimetres in bone. Then this is another animal. This is five days after we first saw a signal that looked like this. The tumour there looks like it's about 3 millimetres across. And upon sacrifice, you could see under histology, that is the tumour. This is the injection site. You can see the injection site is completely closed up. Apologies for that. And what we can see is that tumour is about two and a half millimetres in diameter. And that is readily visible down uh, at using this uh, light tools GFP imaging system. Now it's not entirely relevant to the uh, lecture, but what is really quite frustrating is that that image that we could see with our very expensive CCD camera was also exactly the same as what I could see with my naked eye. Because the autofluorescence was so bright, the CCD camera didn't add any extra sensitivity to these experiments uh, because 
the mouse's leg was glowing a little bit yellow. Basically, my eyes could detect that tumour just as well as the camera could, which again, it's back to that problem of uh, signal-to-noise ratio uh, in uh, fluorescent systems. Anyway, we developed a really nice model that we could then use to show whether when we treat these mice with chemotherapy, do we see tumour regression? And we just watched the screen light slowly fade out over a course of days as the mice were cured with our experimental anti-tumour uh, agents. So all of this work was published here in this particular paper. Um, and we also use this model uh, to look for distant metastases when we inject by either tail vein or, in this case, intracardiac injection. And what we found is when we injected tumour cells in, uh, into the left ventricle, uh, tumours lodged in the bone marrow, in the shoulder blade, and that is a tumour found in an individual vertebra. Now, if we didn't have green crescent protein in the tumour cells, we would never have found this tumour in this vertebra. It's only by doing in vivo imaging that allowed us to actually visualise where these tumours had lodged. And then we knew that we could repeat the process and generate cell culture, cell lines, cell strains that selectively invaded bone because bone metastasis was what my project was all about. So green fluorescent protein is just one of the ways of imaging tumours in bone. The other one is luciferase. And there are some major technical diff difficulties between the two. So, uh, GFP is a very bright signal. We can take all of the pictures at about a thousandth of a second. What my eye can see, the camera can see, is very, very bright. Um, the GFP is excited by blue light. It instantly loses signal without light. So you hold the mouse under the blue light, you get a green signal. But it, what it means is that because you get such a quick image, you can quickly put the animals under the blue light, uh, take a quick picture, put them back in the cage, and you can repeat this process every single day and follow tumours. What you can't do is repeat that process with luciferase because luciferase is much more complicated. Remember, luciferase requires a substrate. Also, luciferase has a very weak signal. So all of these problems mean that you can't do quick, a quick look at a mouse um, every day to see whether there's a tumour there. You have to, uh, you can do that with GFP, you can't do it with a luciferase based system. So if you're using a luciferase based system, the light emitted is much lower, so you need a much longer exposure. You need a five second exposure at least. That means keeping the mouse still, so you've got to anaesthetise the mouse and physically tape it down to, the, uh, to a board underneath the camera. Prior to doing that, you've got to inject the animal with luciferase substrate. This is very expensive. Now, this classes as a surgical procedure or an experimental procedure, and you can't just do this every day to the animals. It's unethical to do that. So you may be able to do this a couple of times a week at most. So you can't do the repeat analyses that you can do with GFP, but what you can do is get much nicer data at fewer data points. The resolution is far better. The burden of quantification is much better. There is no signal-to-noise ratio because these mice are in a darkened box and you're measuring photons coming out, so it's much more sensitive. So it's a lot more difficult to do, a lot more expensive. You need a much more expensive camera, and you need to anaesthetize them and all of that but you get much better data. And this is shown here with some um, skid mice, uh, which have been injected with uh, tumour cells, or in this case, just some cells expressing firefly luciferase. And what you can see here is 30,000 cells have been injected subcutaneously. You get a region that emits light, and that can, can be quantified as the total number of photons. And that is using um, a luciferin substrate. There is a new luciferase, uh, uh, luciferin substrate which emits at a different wavelength which is much much more sensitive. So here's 30,000 cells, here's 300 cells and this gives out more light than this. And here's 30, here's 10, here's just three cells and what you can see you've got a quantitative emission of light uh, with a luciferase system. Now that's possible because you can put the mice in exactly the same position every time you image them and you can accurately measure the amount of light given out that's very different to a GFP model where you're dealing with live wriggling animals. 
Now the improved um, luciferase substrate that I've just mentioned, um, this is, these are two examples of different uh, luciferin, uh, luciferase substrates. This one emits uh, 560, this one emits at 675. And the reason why this one is so good is because this emits in the tissue translucency window or the near, there's also this near infrared window. And this is a window where tissue does not absorb light. Now to demonstrate this to yourself, all you need to do is get a red laser pointer or a, any red LED, go in a darkened room and see that light pass straight through your finger if you put your finger over the LED. Red light passes through tissues very effectively because it's not absorbed by either haemoglobin or oxygenated haemoglobin. Whereas green light and blue light are very, very effectively blocked by haemoglobin. So this is what we call a tissue translucency window. This luciferase, luciferin system emits at 560. That gets absorbed by oxygenated haemoglobin. This emits at 675. And this is just into this near infrared, uh, what's, what's called the near infrared window. Um, and this light can get out of the animal much more effectively than this one can. And this tissue translucency problem is also why green fluorescent protein imaging can be very much more improved. It can be improved. What you can see here is that green fluorescent protein emission at 530 is going to be partially blocked by oxygenated haemoglobin. So one of the, when I did my work back in you know, 2007, 2008, we were dealing with green fluorescent protein. Uh, there's also been the development of red fluorescent proteins and particularly M plum, which emits around here. And this gives much better sensitivity than any of the work that I did. So here are the benefits of luciferase over GFP imaging in live animals. You get higher sensitivity. There's no light to excite the um, luciferase you don't need light so you've got a better signal to noise ratio it's directly quantifiable because your animals are effectively anesthetized and strapped down and you can take a picture of the same region each time you image them so that makes the data much better problems with it you can't see the signal with the naked eye so it's initially harder to pick out transfected successfully transfected cells not impossible but just a bit more tricky the time of analysis is much longer, but you get much better data. And even the cheapest luciferase imaging system is £50,000 plus, whereas my system is about £3,000 um, for a very basic GFP imaging system. Now, there are lots of other things you can do with fluorescent proteins in live animal imaging. And you can start doing really clever things like expressing green fluorescent protein in the mice themselves by making transgenic mice. And you'll cover this in another lecture in this module, I think. So what we can do is express the green fluorescent protein gene under the expression of, in this case, TIE2, which is a, a gene that is only expressed in the vascular endothelium. And this is basically highlighting where the vasculature is in those mice. So this shows the tracks of all the microvessels in the mice. And we can use this to study how tumours interact with the blood vessels, for example. Uh, you can also use fluorescent molecules. We've used uh, FITSI, fluorescein isothiocyanate, labelled dextran. So you can inject that into the vasculature and highlight where all the blood vessels are. Or you could do things like label red blood cells green and monitor their, um, where they go throughout the vasculature. So particularly in vascular biology work, uh, green fluorescent protein and fluorescent molecules are very widely used. Now, I suppose what you need to think to yourself is, how could we use this in another experimental system to assess another experiment? So what I would like to do is just have a little think about, imagine you could express green fluorescent protein in any cell in the body of a mouse. What experiment would you like to do? Just have a think about it. The sorts of things that I've seen done which are really interesting experiments are doing bone marrow transplants between two mice, between one mouse that's green fluorescent, positive, green fluorescent protein positive and another mouse that is wild type. So you put the bone marrow, effectively the immune system of one mouse that's green and fluorescent into another mouse and you can track where all of those cells go and find out, you know, see 
to where they go to and uh, and what basically what those cells are doing. So that's the sort of thing that we can do. Okay, that's the end of the lecture. I hope you found that informative. Hopefully it's going to help with your molecular biology and understand things like codon usage, cloning, um, but also it shows you the sorts of experiments that are routinely done in life sciences research.